and welcome to CO738 Probabilistic Methods. Today we'll be discussing alteration. What is alteration? We've seen this before, but to remind you again, alteration is a method wherein we alter a random outcome to get to the, the desired object. So we take a random procedure, but we're altering it, this random outcome, to get the desired object. All right, today we'll be discussing a few examples that use alteration. They will include a lower bound on Ramsey numbers, which we've seen, but we'll do it again to get a better bound using alteration. Uh, large independent sets in graphs and an example from combinatorial geometry. So let's start with Ramsey numbers. To remind you, the Ramsey number RKL is the minimum integer n, such that in every two coloring of the edges of Kn by colors red and blue, there exists a red copy of Kk or a blue copy of Kl. Usually most interesting here is the diagonal Ramsey numbers when k is equal to L. And we had a result from the first week where Averdos from 1947 that said if n choose k times 2 to the 1 minus k choose 2 is less than 1, then r of Kk is greater than n. So we did that just using a union bound on the probability of monochromatic KKs. Now there we concluded that RKK was at least 2 to the K over 2. Uh, better asymptotic analysis actually does a bit better. It shows that you're at least 1 over E root 2, 1 plus little o 1, of K times 2 to the K over 2. So you get an extra factor of K and actually determine the constant to be 1 over E root 2 using that inequality. Now what we'll do today is we'll show that for all integers n at least zero, that rkk is greater than n minus n choose k times two to the one minus k choose two. So if you're just having an inequality with the, that term n less than one, you can show that rkk is greater than this difference. What good is that? Well, we can actually do some optimizing of n, and I won't tell you what number, but you can work out which and optimizes that difference to show that RKK is greater than 1 over E, 1 plus little o of 1 of K times 2 to the K over 2. So we're actually able to get a uh, square root 2 improvement over Erdos's bound just by using alteration. So that's not a big difference in the grand scheme of things, considering, again, the best known upper bounds are on the order of 4 to the K, but is impressive nonetheless and shows that maybe using different methods can provide different bounds. So let's get to the proof. So it's rather straightforward. Consider a random two coloring of EKN, so the edges of KN, and we let X be the number of monochromatic KKs. Then the expected number of X is N choose K times two to the one minus K choose two. So just by linearity of expectation, probability of each one being monochromatic is two to the one minus K choose two, and then there's N choose K of those sets. So you get this expectation. Now, since we know that, there must exist then an x with x at most the expectation. So this is pretty standard use of linearity of expectation. But here we can do a bit better by using alteration. We now delete one vertex from each monochromatic kk. So there's at most this number in expectation. So there's an outcome with at most n choose k times 2 to the 1 minus k choose 2. If we just delete a vertex from each such monochromatic kk, it removes those bad copies leaving us with a nice coloring of n minus that number, number of vertices. Uh, so that's that proof. This is a standard use of alteration. So we had an outcome. Maybe there, we didn't union bound to say to avoid all these and say, well, here's the expected number. Now we remove one from each of the bad things. So that's a typical use of alteration. I will point out that using the more powerful Lovas local lemma, which we'll see when we get to chapter five, can be used to prove that r of kk is actually greater than square root 2 over e of 1 plus little 1 k times 2 to the k over 2. So we can get another factor root 2 improvement uh, using an even more powerful probabilistic method. Uh, but we'll do that later. So let's move on to our next example, uh, which is about off-diagonal Ramsey numbers. So here I won't tell you the calculations, I'll just say this extends because using just expectation, if we follow Erdos's proof, what you'd want to do is, uh, when k and l are different, is to say that if there existed p in 0, 1, with n choose k times p to the k choose 2 plus n choose l times 1 minus p to the l choose 2 is less than 1, then our kl is greater than n. So here we would uh, take this, this randomness 
uh, where we color edges maybe with different probabilities. So P for one color, one minus P for the other, then we'd have this bound, which would tell us oh, by union bound, if none of these happen, uh, then we have this Ramsey number. And the same, now we've seen that before, but now we can actually also use alteration to give it a somewhat improved bound where for all p and 0, 1 in integers n, our kl is greater than n minus n choose k times p to the k choose 2 minus n choose l times 1 minus p to the l choose 2. So instead of the above bound where we would just optimize uh, for p, now we have the following bound where we optimize for p and n. And that works because again the expected number of monochromatic kk's and monochromatic kl's are those terms on the right there and we could delete one from each to get the desired. So I won't do that proof, but I will just note that this bottom theorem can actually give somewhat much better bounds than the top theorem in the case of uh, more off-diagonal Ramsey numbers. So that's quite nice. So now we're going to move on from Ramsey numbers to our next example, which is about independent sets. This is going to be related to Turan's theorem, which you may have seen from 1941, uh, a rather standard result in extremal graph theory, it says that if g is a KR free graph on n vertices, then the number of edges is at most 1 minus 1 over r minus 1, n choose 2. And the maximum is only achieved by the unique complete r minus 1 parti graph with part sizes nearly equal. Nearly equal meaning off by at most 1, depending on the divisibility of n. So what does this say? It's one of the first results where you exclude a structure here having a clique on r vertices, and you can actually say what's the most number of edges you can get, and you get this nice upper bound. And actually, you can even characterize the extremal example as this natural one coming from complete uh, r minus 1 partite graphs. So we won't prove that. Maybe you've seen the proofs. You could go read uh, Diestel's standard graph theory text to see it. But we'll point out a connection uh, to probabilistic methods. So there's actually a probabilistic proof of Turan's, which we won't do, but I'll just do a, a weaker version of that. In particular, we can prove the following theorem, that if g is a graph with n vertices and n d over two edges, with d at least one, then alpha of g is at least n over 2d. So what is it saying that somehow if you have average degree d, then alpha should be at least n over 2d. Now, using probabilistic methods, we can actually prove more generally that average degree d would give you n over d plus one, but here we'll just do 2d for today. Why, what does that give? It implies a weak form of part a of Turan's theorem. So if we had the d plus one, it would actually give you the whole theorem, but here uh, we don't get it get to a factor of two. How so? Well, you look at the complement. So if you have this graph g that's kr free, it means its complement has independence number at most r minus one. But if you plug that into the above theorem, the number of edges in the complement would have to be at least n squared over four times the independence number, just applying the above theorem, which would then be at least n squared over four r minus one, so the graph would have somewhat at most 1 minus 1 over 2 r minus 1 of n choose 2. And if we again had a better bound in the above theorem, we could actually recover to Rons and we could do even more work to, to prove part b. But let's just do this one because it nicely admits alteration proof. So how do we do it? The probability space will be to let s be a random subset of v of g where each vertex in s is in s independently with probability p to be determined. Okay, so we want to get uh, a large independent set, so let's just pick a set at random. Now that might not be independent, but we will alter it. But let's first compute. We're going to let x be the size of s, and we're going to let y be the number of edges in s. Now what would that give? Well, hence e of x will be equal to np. And note that the probability that e is in g of s will be equal to p squared. So by linear area of expectation, e of x is np, it's just p for each one, and for the probability that e is in g of s is equal to p squared, so p times p for both of its ends. Thus, by linearity of expectation, e of y is equal to the probability of e in g of s of e equals, uh, since that's the same for each one, of e of g times p squared, which is nd2 over, uh, nd over 2 times p squared. Continuing on, now that we've calculated this expectation for y, Let's use linearity of expectation again to show that e of x minus y is equal to e of x minus e of y, which is therefore np minus nd2 d over 2 times p squared. And now we can maximize this difference by setting p to be 1 over d. So you could do some calculus and solve for that. But that would give you that e of x minus y is equal to n over 2d. 
And so what good is that? Well, now we can exploit that there must exist an outcome where x minus y is at least its expectation, which is n over 2d. Now what do we do? We, so y again is the number of edges in GS, so from each edge, arbitrarily pick one end, delete it, and what remains, this x minus y then, uh, will be a size x minus y, will be an independent set. So alpha of g will be at least x minus y, is at least n over 2d from above. So that's a nice use of alteration. We wanted to show that there was a large independent set. The proof idea was to take a random set, it might not be independent, but try to delete one edge, uh, one end of each edge in it. And so if we can show that this difference of x minus y, of vertices to edges, is large, we will succeed in getting a large independent set from that. So that was our second main example about large independent sets, somewhat related to Turan's theorem. Our last example of today will come from combinatorial geometry. So it's quite nice if you haven't seen this before. So for, for a set S of points in the unit square U, we're going to let T of S denote the minimum of P1, P2, P3, and S choose three. So that's three triple of points in S of the area of the triangle P1, P2, P3. So three points in S would make a triangle. Could be flat, I guess, if they're collinear, the area would be like zero. But here we're going to take this minimum over the areas. So tell us what's the smallest triangle we can find inside S. Now that's not quite interesting because again, if they're all collinear, this minimum would just be zero, or if there's three that are collinear. So more interesting is to let T of N be the maximum over all S of TS, where S ranges over all sets of N points in U. So what is that saying? T of N, we kind of want to find a set of points where there aren't really small triangles, as sets of small triangles from them. Now, Halbrun actually conjectured, at least pre-1950, that T of N should be at most one over N squared. That, you know, for every set of points, you should be able to find a small triangle. This turned out to be false, impressively, by Komlosh, Pince, and Samaretti proved this in 1982, that T of N is actually omega of log N over N squared. So it's at least a log n factor bigger than what Halbrun had conjectured. And they did this using a probabilistic construction, right? They have to construct a set of points without small triangles. They were able to do that even more uh, than what Halbrun was conjecturing as an upper bound. So what are we going to do today? We won't do that because it's rather involved. Instead, let me just show you an easier theorem that T of n is at least 1 over 100 n squared using probability. So how can I even convince you this 1 over n squared lower bound is the right answer? So what will be the idea? So you may want to stop and pause maybe and think of this proof idea now having seen various examples of alteration today. How would you do this and how would you use alteration? So here's the proof idea. If you've taken a moment, it's to choose the points in S randomly. So we're going to choose our points uh, in the unit square at random. So we can just, of course, do that. And then what will we do from there? We're going to argue not that we don't, we're not going to union bound and say, oh, that there's, you know, probability of a small triangle is not large. Instead, we're just going to show that in expectation, there are a few small area triangles. So we won't try to avoid all of these small area triangles. We'll just argue that in expectation, there are a few of them. And at that point, we're done because we'll be able to delete one point from each of the small area triangles, still end up with a set of n points, if we start with more than n points, and end up with having no small area triangles. All right, so that is the proof idea. Pretty standard from alteration. Do something random, take an expectation to say roughly what it is, but then alter it here. We're deleting points in small area triangles to delete those small area triangles from our set of points. So let's do the formal proof. The probability space will be to choose, we're going to choose two endpoints as it works out, just a nice number if we're going to have to delete it's roughly, you want to delete roughly on the order of n points to make this work out. So then we'll do that and we'll do them uniformly and independently from u, from the unit square. So that, of course, for one point, that means just choosing between zero and one twice independently uh, among that. All right, so that's our probability space. We're going to let epsilon be 1 over 100 n squared. So that's just a stand-in for the area that we're trying to avoid. And we're going to let x be the number of triangles 
I'll call them PQR, though they come from the PIs, with area at most 1 over 100 n squared. So we want to show that this expectation of x is rather low. How do we do that? It's a little involved, because we have to bound the probability that the area of a given triangle uh, is at most epsilon. And we have to do that as follows. So this is where we need some geometry. So first, let's talk about the first two points, p and q. What's the probability that their distance is equal uh, to b, say, that they're b apart? Well, this would be the limit uh, as delta b goes to zero that d of pq, the distance, is between, say, b and b plus delta b. So we'll do a little bit of calculus here. Uh, now, what's that probability? We're not really, it's a little hard to compute because of the size of the, the squares, but we can certainly upper bound that as the difference of the areas uh, of the two areas of the circles, right? Because to live for, P, for Q to live inside of uh, that distance of P, it has to live in the annulus around P, and that would be at most the area pi P plus delta B squared minus pi B squared. So that's the area of the annulus. So you get that. Now we can take this, uh, expand and take a limit. So we end up with 2 pi B db, where db is the differential. So it's roughly 2 pi b uh, calculus-wise with this infinitesimal. All right, so now that we have this probability distribution, we can move on, but let's talk about r. So given p and q, what's the altitude of r to the line pq? So we look at one pair and we know their distance, that gives us the, the width of the triangle. Now we look to the height. Well, if we want the area to be at most epsilon, the height better be at most 2 epsilon over b. And hence, r would have to lie in a strip of width at most uh, 2 times the height of 4 epsilon over b, and length at most square root of 2. In the other direction, the distance between p and q could be at most square root of 2. So that could be long, but the, the strip around where r has to leave, uh, live is, is a rather small height, something more along epsilon over b. And thus, the probability that r would actually uh, live in that strip would be 4 root 2 epsilon over b, would be the area of the strip, the width times length, divided by the total area, which, since it's a unit square, is 1. All right, so now that we've done a bit of geometry to talk about the widths and the heights, we can combine those to say that the probability of the area is at most epsilon, since b goes between 0 and root 2, is at most the integral, 0 to root 2, of 2 pi b, times db there, that's the uh, probability that pq of distance b, times the probability of the height's what you want, which is 4 root 2 epsilon over b. You'll note that the b's will cancel. We can take 8 root 2 pi epsilon, which are just constants, out of the integral. Then we integrate from 0 to root 2. That'll give us an extra factor of root 2, since you just get constant, which will just be linear. So we get 16 pi epsilon. So we get something roughly on the order of epsilon. There's some constant up front, which is impressive. So now we're almost done, because I just have to remind you that epsilon was 1 over 100 n squared. So this is a little bit more than half of n squared, say 0.6 over n squared. And now we are almost done, since that's the probability of one triangle having small area. What's the expectation? So the expected number of small area triangles are most this sum, so just by using linearity of expectation, the upper bound, it's the number of possible triangles times 0.6 over n squared. What's the number of possible triangles? It's 2n, since there are 2n points, choose 3, all the possible triples. And what you'll notice is the n cubed from that and the n squared cancel out to give n, where the constants will be something like 4 sixths, which is 2 thirds, times 0.6, which will be indeed smaller than 1, so this expectation will be smaller than n. And now we're done because there will exist an outcome with x at most d of x, which is less than n, and we'll delete one point from each triangle, giving the desired set. So another classical example of alteration, wherein we, we didn't prove the log n over n squared, but we proved on the order of at least 1 over n squared, by taking a random set of points and then proceeding to it, go ahead and calculate the, the expected number of small area triangles and delete one from each. This was a little harder since we had to calculate the probability, which required some geometry of the area being small, but we managed to do that and then just proceeded to alter it to get the desired set of points. So that will conclude our lesson for today. We saw three different examples from Ramsey numbers to independent sets to triangles from combinatorial geometry, where we use the method of alteration to alter the random outcome to get our desired object. So until next time, see you then.